Good afternoon or uh, late good morning. Happy lunch. Uh, my name is Rick Cruz, uh, professor and agronomy at Iowa State, director of the Iowa Water Center. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce your keynote lunch speaker, and that is uh, Sean McMahon. Sean has a, a diverse background. He has come through many experiences, basically all of them environmentally oriented. Uh, Sean currently is the executive director of the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance, which is a clean water initiative supported by uh, Iowa Corn Growers Association, Iowa Soybean Association, and Iowa Pork Producers Association. In this capacity, he's working with uh, farmers, encouraging them on a volunteer basis to, to work on the nutrient reduction strategy plan successfully. Now, I mentioned John has a diverse background, uh, environmentally oriented. Sean was the leader of the Iowa legacy legislation, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that passed through the legislature but yet has to be funded, but he did a great job there. He was the uh, program director for the Nature Conservancy he has worked in a variety of different areas dealing with policy. His step into the agricultural arena to try to move an industry forward that has a lot of inertia built into it, I think is going to be a real challenge. But I think uh, we have the right person in the right place at the right time to try to make that happen. Sean, would you come forward and give us a few comments? Please welcome him. Well, thanks so much, Rick, for that kind introduction. And it's really a thrill here to be in Iowa City and uh, really appreciate the University of Iowa for extending the invitation to me, in particular, uh, David and Pete, and also uh, Leslie Gannon, who's been doing a lot of behind the scenes organizing and really doing a, a great job. So I wanted to uh, start off um, by talking about a couple of uh, myths and facts about agriculture to hopefully grab your attention, given that I'm the, the luncheon speaker. And when I put these slides together, to be perfectly candid, I, I was expecting uh, an audience of uh, lay people, um, you know, perhaps uh, more undergrads, perhaps more people from the community. Uh, but looking around, I know several of you are, uh, are experts and, and PhDs, but Bear with me as I go through these uh, couple of myths versus facts. So, if you're at all like me, um, up until uh, recently, in the last five years when I started researching agriculture and water quality, when I was director of uh, the North America Agriculture Program for the Nature Conservancy, you may have been laboring under the, the misperception that farmers' actions almost exclusively determine water quality. You know, as Rick was alluding to, I have a 20-plus year long career uh, working for environmental organizations, uh, groups like Clean Water Action, National Audubon Society, National Wildlife Federation, the Nature Conservancy. And uh, in, in some of those circles in the environmental community, it's uh, taken as, as an article of faith that, you know, our water quality problems are chiefly due to fertilizer management. And if only farmers would do a better job managing their fertilizer, if only they would lessen their rates, then we'd have our water quality problems solved in Iowa and in the Gulf of Mexico, and they'd be solved overnight. Well, as I was... Uh, Researching this issue, I, I determined, as I'm sure many of you have, that that really is not the case. That here in Iowa and elsewhere, other factors are actually uh, much bigger drivers of water quality and, in particular, nitrate concentrations in our waters. And these are factors outside of producers' control, such as weather, climate, and soil fertility. And I'll talk in uh, greater detail about that. But one other fact I'd, I'd share with you 
um, that I learned recently from Iowa State is that the average farmer in a corn soybean rotation is annually applying only about 1% of the nitrogen than what's already included in the soil. You know, the average acre of Iowa farmland actually has 10,000 pounds of organic nitrogen in it. So we'll talk more about the nitrogen cycle. So farmers have been making progress. Uh, they, they can uh, make improvements. They certainly have been. But there's still a lot more that they, they can do. Um, another uh, you know, myth and, and fact I wanted to discuss is um, that farmers are the only ones responsible for water quality. Well, we heard from uh, different speakers about just how substantial the contribution of agriculture is to water quality. And in the context of the, uh, the dead zone, about half of all the nitrogen and phosphorus comes from agriculture, according to the U.S. Geological Survey Sparrow modeling. But there are other important contributions as well, you know, such as uh, industrial, um, urban, and by urban I, I include uh, runoff, stormwater runoff, as well as wastewater treatment facilities, and even natural areas. Um, I, I was surprised when uh, I learned from reading some papers uh, by Tom Eisenhart with Iowa State that actually a majority of our phosphorus comes from our stream banks, where stream banks are, are destabilized. So natural areas are, are a big, big contributor there. So I want to provide you with an overview of what I'll be discussing today. I want to uh, introduce you to my new organization, which is only six months old, the Iowa Agriculture Water Alliance, and talk about just how significant the water quality challenge is in Iowa, but also talk about that globally and in the context of uh, the Mississippi River Basin and, and the Gulf of Mexico. But as uh, Keith Schilling uh, very, very astutely pointed out in numerous times, uh, we didn't get here overnight. You know, in fact, we've had a century and a half of agriculture's impacts on water quality in Iowa. And likewise, we won't solve it overnight. You know, in fact, it'll take uh, many years and even decades to, to adequately address that. And I want to talk about the, the global picture of uh, land use and agriculture and, and food demand and the implications of that uh, for Iowa and also talk about the scale of agricultural production in Iowa and our role in, in food production. And finally, a visit about different conservation practices that are scientifically demonstrated to improve water quality. But an overarching uh, theme for this presentation, and I'm sure uh, you know many to follow, is that more needs to be done. So for starters, uh, the mission of the Iowa Agriculture Water Lines is to increase the pace and scale of farmer-led efforts to improve water quality. As I mentioned, we're just six months old. We were launched last year. Uh, we have three founding organizations, three leading Iowa Ag Associations, the Corn Growers, Iowa Soybean Association, and the Iowa Pork Producers. Uh, we have a very diverse advisory council. Um, some of those folks are, are here with us in the room today, including Larry Weber from the University of Iowa, Kevin Richard from the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, we have uh, other scientists who, who serve on that, uh, folks from Iowa State, also uh, the Agriculture Research Service. We have conservation NGOs from groups like the Nature Conservancy and Pheasants Forever. And we also have farmer leaders. Uh, we have uh, municipal leaders, uh, folks like Steve Hirschner, the head of the, the water utilities for Cedar Rapids. Um, but next, I want to talk about the global footprint of agriculture and how that has changed over time. So this map here uh, shows in red the uh, cropland that occurred in 1700. Uh, so this is pre-industrial revolution. And then if you fast forward three centuries, 
you can see my, how the uh, world has been transformed, uh, where agriculture has become the dominant land use, uh, taking up uh, a majority of our, of our acres. Uh, the red, again, is cropland, and the yellow is pasture. So absolutely transformational. If you uh, look at projections from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, they're projecting that we're going to see uh, more agricultural expansion in the next five decades. You know, especially as we hit 9 billion plus people in 2050, and also in light of how uh, many developing countries as they become wealthier, uh, the demand for animal protein is going to increase. They want to eat more like Americans. So it's uh, estimated that between 2010 and 2050, the world will have to produce more food than the previous 10,000 years of human existence. And I find that really astronomical. But let, let's take a look at um, what those projected increases will do to land use. So it's projected that we will lose about 300 million acres of natural areas. And take a look at sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South America, including the Amazon, and Southeast Asia. So my la last organization, the Nature Conservancy, um, they, they have done more to protect land than any other organization in the world. You know, they protected an area about the size of California in their 60-year history, 120 million acres. Well, that, that sounds like something to celebrate, but not so fast. Um, it's projected that we're going to lose two and a half Californias of natural areas that will be converted to agriculture in the next four decades. So in light of that, um, uh, some of my colleagues and I uh, came up with a strategy of sustainable intensification of agriculture. And this is not a new concept. In fact, uh, President Abraham Lincoln, uh, when he was giving a speech at the Wisconsin State Fair back in uh, 1859, he talked about the thoroughness of agriculture and how we need to in intensify that. But essentially, you know, the sustainable intensification of agriculture strategy comes down to optimizing uh, benefits. And if you're, you know, the theme of this, of this um, symposium is water quality and water availability, and that's incredibly important. But I would encourage all of you to think of the, the big picture and other things like feeding the world, like not wanting to see hundreds of millions of children starve, and also biodiversity in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and the Amazon, uh, tropical forests and temperate grasslands around the world. I would, I would like to think that all of you, like me, are concerned about water quality, but we also uh, do want to uh, feed, feed the world and want to protect biodiversity. So the strategy of sustainable intensification of agriculture is uh, essentially about increasing yields where we currently have cropland. So how do we optimize production on our current cropland so that we can avoid um, additional conversion of natural areas? Now, there's going to need to be conversion of natural areas uh, to some extent around the world. Um, but where that occurs, ideally, that could be directed to areas that are already um, altered in some way, already degraded. You know, unfortunately, Iowa is the most highly altered state in the country. You know, sadly, we've lost 99.9% .9 of our prairies. We've lost 95% of our wetlands. It happens that we have uh, some of the richest soils in the world, and that's uh, the reason for a lot of that, that loss of habitat. But under this strategy of sustainable intensification of agriculture, you want to optimize uh, crop production, food production, in areas with current cropland. And certainly Iowa is, uh, is one of those areas. But next I want to talk about a fertilizer. Uh, this slide here shows the increase of fertilizer. If you look at the, the black line, um, that shows nitrogen. 
and you can see in a 40-year period from 1960 to 2000, globally, there was an 800% increase in nitrogen. So it really skyrocketed. If you look at phosphorus, there's a much smaller increase, um, a little more than 300%. The purpose of my talk is not to discuss uh, water quantity, but the red line shows a 700% increase in irrigation during that same time. So I'm not suggesting that these are the wrong trend lines for, for fertilizer. Um, every other bite of our food comes from fertilizer. Um, if we're going to feed the world and if we're going to minimize uh, the unnecessary expansion of agriculture into natural areas, fertilizer is going to be a part of that solution. However, there, there are um, impacts that come with that. And of course, one of them is water quality. You know, if you're like me, um, up until a few years ago, I was familiar with the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. I was familiar with the hypoxic area in Chesapeake Bay. But I had no idea that there are actually uh, well over 100 documented hypoxic areas around the world. Um, unfortunately, agriculture is the dominant contributor for a majority of those. Um, but now some good news relative to fertilizer. Um, here in the US, uh, we're making tremendous progress. This map here shows a 30-year period from 1980 to 2010. And it shows nitrogen use in the corn sector. Um, there's some ups and downs, but declining 4% during that same period. Now, 4% may not be a striking, eye-popping number. But if you also consider that during that same period, corn yields went up by 87%, that is quite striking. Taken together, uh, those two numbers represent an increase in efficiency of 95%. So Iowa farmers and US farmers in the corn sector and also other row crop sectors are doing more to be more efficient about their nutrient utilization. And it's not out of altruism necessarily. It's uh, based on a need to be more profitable. Um, fertilizer is expensive. Uh, farmers want to minimize that nutrient loss. But increasingly, Iowa farmers and elsewhere are improving their nutrient stewardship and using something called the four R's. And that is the right form of fertilizer applied at the right time, at the right place, and the right rate. So let's talk about um, our soils next in Iowa. So if you look at this slide, this shows a continuum with, uh, um, with organic matter, with the darkest being the, uh, the highest amounts of organic matter. As, as was said earlier, Iowa is blessed with some of the, the richest soils in the world. You know, there are some pockets with high organic mat matter in uh, South Florida, like the Everglades agricultural area where they have muck farming in Wisconsin, Minnesota. But you can see the uh, tremendous concentration right in the Des Moines lobe, the area that Bill was talking about earlier, that the Des Moines and Raccoon Rivers drain. So we're blessed to have fertile soils there. But that's also a double-edged sword because these soils are very vulnerable to nitrate leaching. Uh, when our soil becomes warm and moist, um, bacteria can convert the organic nitrogen to nitrates. And then when it rains, those nitrates leach through the, the root zones of our crops. Um, this slide is similar to one that Keith presented. It shows the vulnerable leaching periods right here. Um, as, as Keith was explaining, our crops need uh, nitrogen when they get established in the spring and a little before um, harvest. Um, however, we get a lot of rain uh, starting in the early spring and continuing through the fall. So during these periods, unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of uh, nutrients taken up by crops. So our waters are very vulnerable to this phenomenon of, of leaching. And uh, part of that is due to uh, changes in land use, which I'll reemphasize in a minute. 
but someone was asking about cover crops earlier. If we're able to get cover crops on either um, after harvest in the fall or ideally earlier, if uh, farmers are, are using an aerial application or a high clearance seeder, then we're able to, uh, to get some cover and those uh, cover crops are taking up uh, nitrates and they're also preventing erosion. So they're preventing the phosphorus which is bound to the soil from getting in our, our waterways. So cover crops is a key part of addressing this mismatch. But I did want to emphasize that the uh, nitrate concentrations in our water has a lot more to do with historic changes in land use and hydrology and our climate and weather than it does to some notion of, of farmers mis mismanaging fertilizer. So this slide you'll recall from Keith's presentation. Uh, between 1950 and 2010, we saw about 10 million acres of, of pasture and what, what Keith termed sod crops, the small grains like oats, wheat, and barley, uh, shift over to, to row crops, corn and soybeans. Um, unfortunately, that represents losing crops that have deep roots uh, during the, uh, the spring and, and fall. And as a result, that has exacerbated our water quality challenges here in Iowa. You can see uh, soybeans coming out of nowhere essentially in the 1930s, up to about 10 million acres, and corn uh, going from, in 1950, about 10 million acres up to about 14 million acres. So back to the uh, the nitrate cycle. Uh, this slide is courtesy of, of Iowa State. And over here, you'll see what is almost an unlimited bank of organic nitrogen in Iowa soils, uh, 10,000 pounds per acre on average. And again, when these soils get warm and moist, uh, bacteria, microbial production of nitrates occurs um, between 100 and 400 pounds of organic nitrogen is converted to nitrates every year. Now, in a, you know, in a corn crop, and a farmer's putting down on, on average you know, 120 to 160 pounds of nitrogen per year. Uh, for soybeans, they're actually not putting any nitrogen down for the most part. But um, in both instances, for both corn and soybeans, about 30 pounds of nitrates leeches off the fields each year. And I think that really illustrates how this isn't about fertilizer management so much as it's about our, our soil fertility and our climate and weather. You know, think about that. Uh, zero nitrogen applied to soybean crops, yet you have about 30 pounds leaching from soybean fields per acre per year. Roughly 150 pounds uh, of nitrogen put down each year for corn crops, and you still have the same amount leaching per year. So uh, next, let's pivot to uh, the scale of agriculture in Iowa. And uh, this, uh, this shows Iowa and our about 23, 24 million acres of, of row crops superimposed on a map of Canada. You know, it was said earlier that this notion of Iowa feeding the world is, is a myth. Well. I would suggest otherwise. Um, this shows the amount of grain that Canada produces at about 45 million metric tons a year. Only about 12 million of those metric tons is corn. You know, the rest is uh, wheat, oats, and barley. You know, here in Iowa, we actually produce 55 million metric tons of grain per year. So if Iowa were its own country, it would be the fourth largest corn producing country in the world. Um, it's a similar story for soybeans. Uh, this shows Iowa superimposed on a map of Canada, and I'm sorry, on China, and China's soybean production is 15 million metric tons, and Iowa produces almost as much, uh, 14 million metric tons. So here again, if Iowa were its own country, it would be the fifth largest soybean producing country in the world. So when you have um, a scale of agriculture to this extent, of course, there are going to be impacts. And here in Iowa, 
those impacts are, are certainly manifest in water quality problems. So you're all familiar with the Gulf of Mexico and, and the dead zone there. Uh, this map here shows nutrient delivery for both nitrogen and phosphorus to the Gulf. Unfortunately for nitrogen, we uh, are among the top three states in the country, contributing between 10 to 17 percent of the nitrate load. For phosphorus, it's uh, not quite as bad. We're not in quite as exclusive of a club, but we are still among the top seven states, contributing between 5 to 10 percent of the phosphorus loading. So you're all familiar with the Gulf of Mexico hypoxia action plan. Uh, several years ago, uh, the science advisory board uh, for the um, Gulf hypoxia team had articulated a goal of 45 percent reduction in total nitrogen and total phosphorus. And if we're able to achieve that goal, um, they've estimated that we'll be able to shrink the size of Gulf hypoxia from a high of around 20,000 kilometers per year to about 5,000 kilometers per year or 2,000 square miles. So that, that size represents the, uh, the average size of Gulf hypoxia between 1980 and 1996. So that's considered the baseline that we're working towards. And uh, that goal has been adopted in the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy to realize a total reduction of 45% in both nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, it was said earlier that the, uh, the strategy was released in late May 2013, so it's not yet two years old, um, but it, it had been a couple years in, in the making. Um, IDALS is the lead on the non-point strategy. The DNR is the lead on the point source strategy. And Iowa State is responsible for the science assessment. And this is considered a, a living document that's going to be uh, refined and, and updated. Um, new practices can be, be included uh, once it's been proven that they do have reductions in, in water quality. And the focus is on those practices that are scientifically demonstrated to improve water quality. Um, I thought it was interesting uh, when one of the speakers earlier talked about how, uh, you know, within, you know, the same year that the strategy was released, that there were record nitrate concentrations in the Raccoon River. And yes, that, that is true. But as Keith Schilling had pointed out, you know, there's also, if you look at a longer trend, uh, nitrate concentrations in the Raccoon have actually been decreasing by over 20% if you go back uh, 15 years. And then if you look at sediment, sediment loads in the Raccoon River have decreased by 80% since the 1970s. So there have been substantial reductions in, in nutrients. You know, of course, sediment uh, also carries a lot of phosphorus since the phosphorus is bound to the sediment. But, you know, we, we have had, as I mentioned earlier, a century and a half of impacts of agriculture on water quality. So we're not going to get there overnight or in one year or even five years. You know, it's really going to take decades to meaningfully address. You know, one of the uh, key innovations of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy is that it brings together the non-point source community with the point source community. And it looks to have uh, innovative ways to find the most cost-effective measures to reduce water quality. As wastewater treatment facilities have to have uh, more stringent permit obligations in the future. Um, cities like Cedar Rapids, Charles City, uh, Storm Lake, and others are looking at, at the opportunities to partner with farmers and ag associations to implement conservation practices so they can realize those reductions for much cheaper. You know, in many cases, uh, you know, one twentieth of the cost or even less. I see Mayor Irv nodding his head, representing Charles City. But I, I actually think the, the discussion about non-point and point source is the wrong discussion. You know, it should really be about clean water. I mean, we all want clean water. 
whether or not we're representing point source or non-point non source. But we're going to need some time to get there. You know, it, it's interesting to me that the Clean Water Act, which of course does articulate point sources that, that are regulated, you know, that, that has several requirements, uh, one of which is to not put raw untreated sewage into our rivers. Well, in the city of Des Moines, like many other river cities, uh, that city has been struggling with their combined sewage overflows, where the same pipe has the storm water as well as the, as well as the sewage. And so when you have certain rain events, those can combine and unfortunately find its way into our waterways. So this problem was identified decades ago, but it takes time to address. You know, there's now a consent decree between the city of Des Moines and uh, the Attorney General of Iowa and EPA under the Clean Water Act, but it takes time to address. That consent decree gives the city of Des Moines until 2023 to stop putting raw untreated sewage through combined sewage overflows into the water. So I'm suggesting that it will also take time to address non-point source uh, pollution from agricultural runoff. Another innovation of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy is the Water Quality Initiative and the targeted watersheds. There are nine targeted watersheds throughout the state, and there's now 16 different demonstration projects. Um, there's a wide range of partners, over, over 90 are involved in these different projects, and there's strong outreach and education components. Um, there's also a lot of regional efforts to share knowledge with producers and landowners, uh, farm managers, etc. But certainly much more needs to be done. Um, there has been uh, an increase in practices like cover crops and no-till and strip-till in recent years, but we definitely need to increase the scale of that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, different practices. So uh, we heard from Keith Schilling's talk about just how extensively drained Iowa's landscape is. Again, we're the most highly altered uh, state in the country, and we have extensive tiling or subsurface drainage. Uh, science has, has shown us that where we do have uh, subsurface drainage, it's very important to intercept the tile lines and have edge of field practices like bioreactors and saturated buffers. In both instances, a drainage control structure uh, controls the water flow. In the case of bioreactors, it diverts water into a trench that's filled with wood chips. And then bacteria um, initiate the denitrification process. So this has been shown to be very effective at removing about 48% of the nitrates from uh, tile lines that go through a bioreactor. Uh, saturated buffers are a very similar principle. You have another water control structure that sends water out uh, laterally uh, parallel to the field through a tile that is perforated and then gravity takes it through an existing buffer where the uh, trees and shrubs and, and grasses uh, pull up the, the water through evaporation, um, evapotranspiration and utilize the nutrients. There's also several uh, infield practices. Uh, prairie strips represents the latest one, uh, which has been shown to reduce runoff and nitrogen and phosphorus by um, over 80%. And in addition to water quality, it also has uh, benefits for, for wildlife habitat, for pollinators. So there are several other practices that I'm, I'm not sharing with you today due to uh, our, our constraints of time, but um, I'm, I like to say that when it comes to improving water quality in Iowa, there's no one silver bullet, but by using the right combination of edge of field and infield practices, there is silver buckshot, and we know these work. You know, it was suggested earlier that, you know, it's incredulous to think that farmers are tracking the nitrates in their water at the edge of field. Well, a couple months ago, I presented with a farmer Tim Smith from Eagle Grove, who farms in the Boone River watershed, he's doing just that. And he's seen his nitrate concentrations come down from about 20 parts per million to about five after implementing cover crops, strip till, and a bioreactor. 
And there's over 100 farmers partnering with the Iowa Soybean Association doing edge of field water quality monitoring. So I can assure you that farmers are tracking their water quality. Do there need to be more doing so? Absolutely. But there's so much more now than there were um, even one or two years ago. So in summary, I want to uh, again emphasize that our water quality challenges here in Iowa are substantial. You know, according to the DNR, we have 141 impaired lakes and 480 segments of impaired streams. Um, again, it's going to take time to solve this, you know, probably decades. Um, but there are uh, many, many studies that show that uh, practices are working to improve water quality. There's a watershed in Wisconsin in the Pecatonica where they have uh, shown an increase in, in water quality and improvement in water quality at the watershed scale. They did so by targeting. They had determined that uh, their phosphorus was the primary resource concern, and about 61 of the phosphorus was coming from 10% of the acres. So we need to take that approach to Iowa. Um, but also, in summation, the global demand for food you know, requires a collaborative and, and responsible approach, and we need to think about our water quality challenges in, in that context. Um, I, I think we should all think about sustainable intensification of agriculture. How can we increase yields on our current cropland, but to do so in an increasingly sustainable manner that includes improving water quality? And finally, I would just reemphasize that our contribution to, uh, to uh, feeding the world uh, comes from our, our rich organic soils, but those soils are also vulnerable to leaching given our uh, current dominant cropping system of uh, corn and soybeans. And finally, I would just acknowledge uh, some of the individuals who helped me prepare this slide deck and then uh, ask if there are any questions. And I think Rick's going to moderate that. <laughs> well, one of the th yeah. So to to paraphrase, there are some bad actor farmers in Iowa that are responsible for an inordinate amount of the environmental damage. So how do we get those farmers to do something without regulation? One of the things that I'm uh, very interested in is uh, having economic drivers of conservation practices. We talked earlier about nutrient stewardship. You know, it's in every farmer's bottom line to be reducing their nutrient loss to increase the amount of fertilizer that's taken up by the crops and to reduce the amount that's leached and washed away. So there, there's a very clear economic benefit. However, for other practices that are important for you know, reducing erosion and phosphorus and nitrates, things like cover crops and no-till and strip-till, that economic benefit hasn't been thoroughly documented and it likely is an economic benefit that's realized over multiple years. As you're improving the structure of the soil, the porosity, as you're increasing the soil organic matter, as you're improving the uh, microbial communities within the soil, as you're doing those things, you'll increase productivity and profitability. But that will take a few years. And oftentimes, uh, producers are, are making economic decisions in the context of just one crop year. So helping uh, producers understand the long-term economic benefits of those conservation practices is really critical. If we have the, the proper investment, Okay, so the question was, can we uh, realize the goals of the nutrient reduction strategy 
given the current amount of corn and soybean acres in Iowa. So the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy has a few different scenarios whereby we can realize that 45% reduction in nitrogen and phosphorus. And the one that's widely considered to have the, the highest uh, uh, chance to succeed has a combination of infield practices and edge of field practices. To some extent, there's some land use practices that involve uh, replacing corn and soybeans, uh, taking that land out of production. But for the most part, they're infield practices like cover crops and they're edge of field practices like bioreactors and saturated buffers. So yes is the answer. We can do it. But we need to scale up our investment. We're not going to get there at the rate we're currently uh, doing so through uh, federal and state appropriations. Uh, one, one promising uh, thing is that there are companies such as AgSolver that are looking at subfield profitability zones and they're starting to show farmers that you know on average between 3 and 14 percent of their acres year in year out are not profitable. So farmers can improve their profitability by taking that unprofitable land out of production and even if they do nothing else they just stop using a, a tillage and and fertilizer, there'll be some uh, water quality benefits. But if they go a step further and put in prairie strips or buffers or wetlands in those unproductive acres, then that'll really accelerate our progress on the strategy. Yeah, for, another, for another couple hours at least, if anyone has additional questions. Let's give thanks, let's thank Sean one more time.